Let me tell you a little story. Once upon a time, there were two brothers, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. The older one was favored by his adoptive father, went to a university, got a good job, built a corporation that employed thousands of people and made billions. Whereas the younger brother was like, ha, <laughs> nerd. I'm gonna go like party in the mountains or something and like, I don't know, party and whatever, man. And that's basically Kyrgyzstan. It's time to learn geography. No! Hey everyone, I'm your host Barbs. If you don't know anything about Kyrgyzstan, which I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't, basically they are like the party animals of Central Asia. Dude, they love to dance. And what better way to start the party than by telling you where the party's at? Okay guys, seriously, I'm gonna have to ring the bell again. Kyrgyzstan is a tripster nation, one that few people go to that you might wanna start checking out now before the massive flocks of annoying tourists come in and ruin everything. First of all, Kyrgyzstan is landlocked, located in Central Asia, surrounded by four countries with a horrible mess of enclaves and exclaves mostly mixed in with Uzbekistan, in this area known as the Fergana Valley. We'll talk more about this in a bit. The capital is Bishkek, located in the north, and the country is divided into seven regions, or oblasts, with the two largest cities, Bishkek and Osh, acting as independent entities with the same status as an Oblast. Of course, after those two, the third largest city is Jalal Abad. However, Karakol is a more popular tourist destination. The largest airports are, of course, also found in the largest cities. Bishkek's Manas International and Osh International Airport. Okay, now back to the enclave exclave thing. Basically, over here, you see a ton of choppy scraps of land that make no sense because they belong to other countries within Kyrgyzstan. You have the four Uzbek exclaves, including the largest one, Solk, which is strange because it's Uzbek territory even though it's 99% populated by Tajiks. With Tajikistan, you have Voruch as well as the area of Kairagakh. But I think Google Earth got it wrong because they put the borders here, which is just an empty stretch of uninhabited road. This all happened because of a number of factors, some being because of things like areas having historically inhabited people groups, and other things like, you know, back in Soviet Russia, anything was being possible. But yeah, that basically covers it. I mean, the country kind of looks like a fish with a deformed back fin. But yeah, that pretty much concludes the land demarcations. All right, this is the part where we mentioned some notable places of interest, so here we go. Forgive my horrible pronunciations. Karakol's Dungan Mask, Ala Square with the Manas Complex, the Ak Urgo Yurt Workshop, the State Museum of Fine Arts, Jema and Ashk Bazaars, Karakol's Animal Market, the Kashoi Ruins, the Monument to Yuri Gagarin, these petroglyphs, Tash Rabat, the Hippodrome, and probably the most iconic national monument, Burana Tower, which is like one of the oldest buildings in the country that still stands today, even though some of it was destroyed, but it's still there. Sweet. Moving on. Now, the biggest appeal to Kyrgyzstan is hands down the landscape. I mean, they have thousands of lakes, over 400 rivers and canals, 88 mountain ranges, forests, and almost all of it is untouched so far. First of all, the country is over three quarters mountainous with the Tian Shan Mountains making up the majority of the land. Here you can also find the source of the longest river being the Narin that flows westward. But the Chu River is probably the most important as it flows through Bishkek and empties into the largest, most iconic physical landmark, Isikul Lake, the largest in the country. Isikul is the second largest saline lake after the Caspian Sea and the second largest high altitude lake after Lake Titicaca in South America. <laughs> South America. The cool thing is, the salt water, in addition to hot springs, causes the lake to never freeze, even in the freezing winter months. Just to hop away, you can find the tallest mountain, Jengish Choksu, which is shared with China at the border. Yeah, China kind of has this thing where they like to take, share, share, half of everybody's highest points. Dude, that's the second time you made that joke. And I'll keep it coming. I'm watching you. <laughs> no, you're not. Ooh, edgy. <laughs> They have the sixth largest non-polar glacier in the world, Inilchek. They have crazy looking canyons like Fairy Tale Canyon and the Seven Bulls Cliffs. And on top of that, at over 27,000 acres, they have the world's largest walnut forest. Yeah, walnuts. Speaking of which, food-wise, they are very similar to their brothers in Kazakhstan up north, but they add a little mountain flair to the dishes, like Beshbarmak, Plov, Kurdak, Oromo, which is also the name of that people group that we studied in the Ethiopia episode, remember? Oromo people? <laughs> Manti, Bursok, Kurut, Shorpo, and vodka is super cheap. Cheap. It's only like $4 a bottle. The national animal is the snow leopard, and Kyrgyzstan's wildlife is a little more diverse and unique from their cousins. They have things like the Marco Polo sheep, the largest in the world, stone martens, brown bears, palas cats, and of course horses, which they like to use for both meat and milk. Which, by the way, milking a horse is really difficult. Kyrgyzstan is also famous for being an insanely untapped potential candidate for green energy. In fact, they make so much energy through hydroelectric dams that they actually end up exporting it to their neighbor countries. Outside investors have been keeping their eyes on Kyrgyzstan for a while. It's like, hey, Kyrgyzstan. Yeah, what's up? How many days of sunshine do you have? I mean, 250, give or take. Okay. And those valleys in the Ali mountain range are pretty windy year-round, aren't they? Yeah, definitely. Okay, okay. So, here's an idea for you. Why don't we, like, build a ton of solar panels and wind turbines Wait, together? We I mean, that's cool, man. We'll get to that eventually. Okay. 
Okay. But I think we should dance first. What? Oh, and they also have the world's last pure mercury mine in the world. I mean, they have a lot of mines and gold makes up a huge portion of their exports, but yeah, mercury is a big deal too. That stuff can kill you if you're not careful. Oh, now you tell me. Kyrgyzstan is beautiful with a lot of economic potential, but they don't seem to tap into it too much. I mean, they'd rather climb trees than cut them down. And that's kind of like the Kyrgyz way, which brings us to... Kyrgyz. That's what you call these people. Kyrgyz. Not Kyrgyzstani, not Kyrgyzstanian. Kyrgyz. Got it? Good. Kyrgyzstan originally comes from a word that means something along the lines of we are 40, referring to the original 40 tribes that inhabited the area. 40 is an important number to these people, and everything starts with this guy, Manas. We'll jump into that in a sec. But first, Kyrgyzstan is made up of about 6 million people and has one of the most evenly distributed populations per square kilometer, as over 65% of the population being rural. The country is about 75% Kyrgyz, 12% Uzbek, 6% Russian, and the remainder is made up of various other people groups like Chinese, Chinese Uyghurs, and so on. They also use the SOM as their currency, which is one of the only currencies that uses a denomination of three. They use a type C plug outlet and they drive on the right side of the road. Now I asked some of you Kyrgyz subscribers what your culture is like and the responses I mostly got were, we are very similar to our Kazakh brothers, but we are mountain folk. We grew up with a very different terrain that has forced us to live a very different life. We have a more relaxed party atmosphere and enjoy nature, but we aren't pushovers like some of our neighbors. If there's a problem, we face it and we will fight back. Why do you think we kicked out two of our presidents? I'm not even joking. That was like literally in one of my emails that one of you guys wrote to me. Surprisingly, EU and US citizens do not require a visa upon entry, unlike some of their neighbors. Hey, you want to see doorway to hell, you pay and then get out. Nah, Turkmenistan's cool. It's just, wow, they make entry so difficult. Anywho, as mentioned, there are historical tribes. However, these were all united by the hero of Kyrgyzstan, Manas, a guy from the 10th century who fought against the Khitan and Oryat enemies, making him the central figure of the longest epic poem in the world. So many things are named after this guy. Streets, statues, universities, radio stations, national parks, and the largest airport. The whole Manas thing kind of solidified the Kyrgyz identity apart from their neighbors. Now they could claim a whole new culture based off of mountain tribes and warriors. Speaking of which, they were part of kind of like the invading people groups that forced China to build their Great Wall. Which brings us to history. Scythians. Turkic tribes invade. Different Turkic tribes defeat the Uyghur Khanate. The Manas guy comes in. They form their own Kyrgyz Khanate. Genghis Khan and the Mongols. 19th century, Khanate of Kokand. 1850s, Russians come in. 1918, Kyrgyzstan becomes part of the Soviet Union. Until 1991, when Kyrgyzstan gains independence. Two revolutions, one in 2005 and another in 2010, and here we are today! The Kyrgyz language is almost completely identical to the Kazakh language, which is pretty intelligible to the Turkish language, as they are all Turkic-based. Nonetheless, Russian is also an official language, as it was taught during Soviet times. The majority of people, around 88% of Kyrgyzstan, identifies as Muslim. However, you don't really see a strong Islamic presence, as it was suppressed during Soviet times, and plus the traditional Turkic and Mongoloid culture kind of infuses pre-Islamic concepts in their lifestyles. You see it a lot during their celebrations and traditional music and dances. Marriages are very interesting in Kyrgyzstan. To avoid relative marrying, most children learn their male ancestors down to the seventh generation or so. And yes, there is that stigma of kidnap weddings. However, it's not exactly what you think. Basically, most people in the past were arranged to be married by families that were close friends. However, if there were two people that loved each other but their families didn't approve, the only way to get married would be if the woman was kidnapped by her lover and once married, the families couldn't do anything. It was kind of like a weird, illegally romantic thing. Unfortunately, in the more common era, this practice has become corrupted and some men took it to the extreme of literally kidnapping women that they just wanted to marry regardless of the woman's consent. Today the practice is shunned upon and it's left a tarnished mark on the Kyrgyz people. Oh, and uh, Kyrgyzstan is also famous for their dances that they take very seriously. Their traditional style incorporates a lot of shoulder jerking movements and bending, which is probably where the modern performers like these guys got their inspiration from. Ugh, that shoulder thing. I mean, I know it'll give me nightmares, but I can't stop looking. Speaking of performers, some famous people of Kyrgyzstan might include Chingis Aitmatov, Rosa Utunbaeva, Isa Akhunbaev, Valentina Shevchenko, Igor Paklin, Talant Dushebaev, Eldar Jangirov, Sadijan Sharipov, Suimenkul Chokmorov, Kurmanjan Datka, Mahmoud Arkashkari, and Yusuf Palasaguni. All right, so basically Kyrgyz people are like mountain folk, Turkic, Mongoloid, hybrid, Muslimy people with cool dance moves. I could have just summarized this whole segment with that, but you know, Oh, gotta hit that 10 minute YouTube mark, so extra monetization. <laughs> All right, moving on. 
All right, Kyrgyzstan's friends are interesting considering how politically diverse they all are. But you know, with Kyrgyzstan, it's like, meh, I don't care if you lean on complete anarchy. If we open up trade deals, you have my attention. With China, things are kind of good as they make up the largest trade partner, especially after the city of Narin gained free trade zone status. Tons of Chinese people have opened up businesses and moved in. This, however, gives Kyrgyzstan a vigilant eye considering what happened to the Uyghur autonomous region. So yeah. When it comes to Russia, Kyrgyzstan actually really liked being part of the Soviet Union during Soviet times and was always trying to fight for attention that they unfortunately didn't get too much of. It was actually Russia that had to kind of encourage them to go and adopt their own economic model and currency. To this day, Soviet memorabilia is still on display in public squares, and even after independence, they still love getting visits from their former occupier. The USA, on the other hand, provides humanitarian and military assistance and help them get into the World Trade Organization. So there's a friendliness aspect there too. When it comes to their best friends, however, almost all Kyrgyz people I talked to have said Kazakhstan, and some said Turkey as well. Turkey was the first country to recognize Kyrgyzstan's independence and has an eternal friendship cooperation agreement with them, as well as embassies and investments. Kazakhstan is basically Kyrgyzstan's big brother that does all the business and trade that trickles into Kyrgyzstan. When squabbles with Uzbekistan come in, like pipeline shutdowns, they run to Kazakhstan who mediates and fixes things up for them. They speak the same, they eat the same. When Kazakhstan is pushing himself too hard, Kyrgyzstan is like, hey bro, stop it. Just take a break. Come get some fresh mountain air and take a dip in Isikul. Beshbarmak is on me. In conclusion, Kyrgyzstan is the little brother that knows he's surrounded by economic giants. So rather than getting intimidated, he just dances dances all his worries away. Stay tuned, Lao is coming up next.